All right, well, hello again. Um, I'm, I'm Gabriel, uh, this is Matt, and yeah, today we're basically going to be talking to you about um, encoding and, decoding, mod dec and decoding models of neural activity. And this is more or less the, the outline for, for the, this introductory lecture. So it's going to be focused on two main things. First is just um, the motivation section. So what are the purpose of encoding and decoding models in the context of, uh, of, of neuroscience and how can, how can they be used to understand neural activity? And then in the background section, we're going to give a, just a brief uh, history of linear regression and like GLMs just to um, put things in context. And then um, we're going to spend the, the bulk of that section more in the current applications part where we're going to be talking a little bit about um, how we in the lab use linear encoding models um, for the, the questions that we're interested in. And that's going to be very useful, especially for like the hands-on demos um, in the afternoon. Okay? All right. So first, first things off, what are the purpose of encoding and decoding models? So encoding models are used to understand how behavioral and task variables influence neural activity. So you can think of this um, as how, how, how does, when, when, I, when I'm perceiving a stimulus, how is this stimulus being encoded um, in the brain? And decoding models um, are used to understand how behavioral and task variables can be extracted from neural activity. So if I have a recording from a single neuron or a, a population of neurons, am I able to detect what stimulus was being presented based on just the activity? And then, right, how do they work? So this is just a very simplified a schematic of, uh, of an encoding model. So here we have a, a smiley face in the here on the left, so this is what we call like the image. This image is then passed on to uh, a model. This model can take a bunch of different forms. It can be a linear model, nonlinear model. I'll give some examples of that in the next slide. But basically, what we're trying to what we're trying to get at here is, can we predict the neural activity with just the smiley face? And so, some examples of, of encoding models in, in terms of linear encoding models, we have simple linear regression. Um, which uh, I believe you guys covered already in the first day, but we're going to go a little bit into detail with that today as well. Um, we also have like polynomial regression as well as regression with regularization, um, and we're we're going to talk we're going to talk about, talk about regularization um, in the methods part of this, um, as well as in the in the first notebook that we're going to discuss in the philosophy section. Um, and there are two main types of uh, regression with regularization: rich regression and lasso regression. We're going to talk, we're going to explain both of them, but we're definitely going to be focusing on rich regression um, for this workshop. And then we also have nonlinear encoding models. So these are, are, are out of scope for what we're going to be talking about in this workshop, but we just wanted to um, briefly mention that they do exist, right? And here we have um, classic uh, generalized linear models, such as like GLMs, as well as like neural networks. And then I just wanted to give like, a, since I'm not going to touch on them um, um, anymore in the presentation, I just want to briefly mention how, how might nonlinear encoding models look like. And so here, if we look at uh, the first one to the left, the linear nonlinear Poisson model or the GLM, how it works is that if you, have a, if you have a stimulus, that stimulus is passed on to this stimulus filter, which works linearly. So it's, it can also be called a linear filter. And then where the nonlinearity comes into place is that um, in this cascade, the output of the stimulus filter is passed on to this point nonlinearity. And this can be, um, this can be an exponential distribution um, or logarithmic as well. And then the output of that is then passed on to like a, a, a Poisson spiking process. And that is basically coupled all of that together. That's what people use to generate uh, spikes, right? So this is one example of a nonlinear encoding model. Uh, instantaneous, instantaneous spiking rate. And then we also have, you can also have uh, more complex versions of this. So um, you can also have a multi-neuron uh, GLM, right? Where in addition to having the exponential uh, nonlinearity and the Poisson spiking or probabilistic spiking process, you can also have like a, uh, a post-spike filter, which basically is just giving some, some feedback back into um, what the, the model was encoding at the beginning. And this can be used also to be communicated onto uh, 
um, different neurons in this network, in this case between neuron one and neuron, and neuron two, which can then influence the, the instantaneous spike rate of both neurons. But yeah, this is just a, a brief overview of what a nonlinear encoding model looks like, okay? But we're, not, we're gonna focus on the linear ones later. So I believe it's because that's, um, that's what's been observed that, that, um, that neurons behave like um, when it comes to um, how they generate spikes. They don't really gen generate them in a, in a deterministic fashion. It really is um, sort of random. And so that's the, the Poisson processes sort of simulate these, um, the, these random patterns of behavior that we observe in neurons. Yeah. Okay. All right, and so the other side of this are, are decoding models, right? And this is really just a flipped image of, of the encoding models. But here what we're trying to do is that we, we, we have neural activity, and then this is, this is passed on to some sort of model again, um, which can take different forms. And what we're trying to, the question that we're trying to address here is can we predict if the image is a smiley face with just the neural activity? And then some examples of decoding models, um, which we won't uh, go into too much detail, um, are support, support vector machines, which are used for classification uh, problems, as well as logistic regression, um, which is also uh, very highly used in the psychophysics field, um, in, in addition to random forest classifiers and hidden Markov models. And I believe um, you have a, um, uh, another day where you're going to go much more in detail um, into how uh, hidden Markov models work. Um, I believe uh, Matt White was talking. Yeah. And so now the, the question is, how do you decide which model to use um, when analyzing your data? And so the answer to that question is, it, it depends on the question. <laughs> so here I'm, ge I'm just briefly generating some um, pros and cons lists for, for encoding and decoding models. So what, what, are, what are the benefits of using encoding models? Encoding models, they allow you to separate the contributions of different variables to neural activity. And this in turn can help you identify which variables are most important for driving neural activity. Basically, in, 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 in other words, what this means is that if you're, you're trying to determine whether variable A is more influential in, 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 driving variable, um, in driving neural activity than variable B, linear encoding models are a very useful way to, to address that question. And you can also, um, because of how they work, you can, you're, you're able to use more complex data sets with many features, which isn't always necessarily the case with uh, decoding models. But um, the, ne the, the cons of these is that they struggle with interpreting variables that are related to each other, and we call this, prob we call this the problem of collinearity. And ba basically, this, this happens because they rely on simplifying assumptions such as assuming that each response variable behaves independently of one another. This, this is not always a problem, but if you have the case, but you know, pe people have, have seen that um, when you look at noise in, in neural populations, noise varies, um, in, uh, varies in, in correlated fashions across entire populations of neurons, right? So you, there, are, there are intrinsic properties of how neurons behave that make it so that they aren't truly independent of one another. But when, but when we're building these models, we have to sort of make that assumption, right? So that's always something to, 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 keep, in, to keep into consideration. And then um, same thing, but for like decoding models. And so the, the, the pros of this is that they can be used to determine whether information is present in a brain area or not. And they, um, as I mentioned, they use multivariate noise to their advantage. So noise that is present in neurons, in different neurons or different voxels, in the case of uh, fMRI imaging, they can use that information um, for, for their decoding process, whereas in encoding models, that's not the case. And also on the more, um, uh, practical application of this, they, 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 have been, they have enabled the development of brain machine interfaces, which are becoming increasingly important in healthcare, and they can also be used for clinical diagnosis. But obviously, a word of caution there, as, uh, as always. Um, the cons of decoding models, though, is that they, they really cannot be used as models of brain processing, especially in sensory systems, since they don't 
operate in the, in the inverse direction. And what I mean with that is that I mentioned previously that you can think of encoding and decoding as just um, opposites of each other. But when you look at, but when you're looking at the brain, actually, what, it, what you have isn't that one brain region is encoding some information um, and just another brain region just has to decode that information back, but more so it has to get information, for example, in a sensory system, um, like the, the visual cortex receives information from, um, from the retina, right? So it, it's encoding that, that, that visual information in visual cortex, but then that information doesn't just need to be decoded into another neural population, it needs to be translated to like motor activity, right? So it's not necessarily the, the, it's not necessarily that decoding only occurs in the inverse direction, but it also needs to be transformed into other, other types of information in, in the case of uh, motor representations and motor outputs. So that's just something to keep in mind when considering the biology of this as well. And um, yeah, and the last one is that they do not generally provide information about computational mechanisms. And so you can see if, if, if information is present but not necessarily understand how it was transformed from neural representation to a behavioral outcome. And this was, this was what I was trying to get at with the example of, um, of the sensory systems. Okay, yeah. What are some examples of using clinical diagnosis? Right, so in terms of clinical diagnosis, you can, I'm, I, don't, I don't have an example right now off the top of my head, um, but I know I've, 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 I, I, we, we've discussed those papers uh, in, in, in our courses, but basically um, you, can, you, can, you can basically take, if, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to determine whether a uh, patient A has, um, um, has a, a disease or not, right? And you know that this, uh, this disease is, cor is, is correlated, not, not the disease is correlated, but that um, you have the occurrence of certain uh, like neural patterns, for example, um, in epilepsy. Actually, I, I just thought of, uh, of, of an example. In, in, in epilepsy, um, when patient, um, people sometimes uh, report that they have these like hallucinations, that, that these like pre-epilepsy auras that come on um, right before the onset of the actual seizure event. And people have been able, have, have found that, for example, um, Whenever these 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 auras that, are, that precede these seizures they occur, they observe this um, slow wave, like one to four hertz um, delta uh, modulation in retinal spinal cortex. Right. So one way that you can use a decoder in terms of uh, for for clinical diagnosis, or maybe maybe diagnosis is not necessarily the word, but just in a clinical setting is that you can you're able to use a decoder to tell if the, if the person is going to go in, is going to have uh, uh, an epileptic seizure or not. If, you're, if, if that patient presents the, the, um, the phenotype of having this, this well-characterized um, delta uh, waves in, in, in rectal spinal cortex. So yeah, that, that's an example. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know about so that one. You have a dog that can like yeah. smell um, low blood sugars. Oh, so it okay, okay. So it decodes your symptoms. But you yeah. cannot probe the dog for information about the mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> so like, why is your blood sugar low? Well, yeah. Just tell you that it is. Right. Um, yeah. One other example that's not really neuroscience, but in, like in radiology, there's a ton of work going into like going from image to is this cancerous, is this not? Um, so. That, that would be another example. It's kind of a new frontier, I think. Um, yeah. It has its potential. But same thing. We look at the image. We don't know why the decoder thinks this is or isn't yeah. or like a nodule or something, but mm -hmm. it finds it out. Um, and, and that's kind of good enough for that image to smell. Um, yeah. Another thing that I, that I didn't mention also is that enable to, it, for, for decoders to be able to, to to decode like situations like this, they need to have very high quality data um, to be trained on. And that's not always necessarily like available, right? Or, or isn't necessarily applicable in every case. So they are, when they work, they are very powerful tools.
but it's not always, they, they, they're not always easily applicable to like any situation, right? Um, if you don't have a clearly observable phenotype, right? Can I have one more? Yeah, yeah, of course. Just to sort of prime for later on. It's yeah. like, um, decoders will like capture linear, like collinear things and lump them together. So it's very easy to misinterpret a decoder. Like, yeah. um, we're going to talk about like a decision making task for mice. And let's say we're trying to decode whether the mouse is going to choose the right side or the left side. But if the mouse performs a task with like 95% accuracy, stimulus and side are almost always the same. So you have to be very careful when you build your decoder. Like we're, we could be decoding stimulus related activity. Or you think we're building a choice decoder. Um, yeah. I think talk about that. Is decoding model like always a classification problem? Um is it Matt, do you know? I, 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 yeah, I, I know they're they're usually taught in, in like the samples that I mentioned are, are all classification samples, but I'm not entirely sure. Like a behavioral outcome that's a, you know, a linear scale, then yeah. Could be. All right, yeah. And so for, for this workshop, what we're going to be focusing on, what we're interested in, is in understanding how behavioral variables and, and uh, task events, task as in a decision-making task, um, how they shape neural activity. So we will be focus focusing on encoding models for the rest of this workshop, okay? All right, and so now just some like brief history on, on linear regression. Um, it, it's based on the method of least squares or minimum squared error. And what this does is that this measures how well a line fits to data by calculating the mean squared distance between an observed value and the value predicted by um, the linear model in this case. And this was this this has been along for for this has been around for quite quite a bit of time. It was the first um, publication on on least squares um, was in 1805 by Legendre, and it, it was used to predict the orbits of comets. And Generalized linear models, or GLMs, they function similarly to linear regression models, but as I mentioned previously, they incorporate nonlinearities to capture more complex relationships between input and output variables. Um, and this subpoint was just what I mentioned in, the, in that slide, where you, you can have a linear filter coupled to a nonlinearity and a process, a Poisson process, otherwise called an LNP model, that can allow you to model instantaneous firing rates for neurons. And if you're interested in that paper, it's really, really cool paper. Um, that's Pillow 20, 2008. Yeah. Uh, goes a bit back to like, uh, that decoding and encoding models, they are not just mirror version of each other, but mm -hmm. rather they can set like different aspects. And uh, my question is specific to, if we are looking for a biological mechanism, like usually on the weight matrices these models generate, yeah. is it fair to say that the encoding models are more uh, informative on that realm. No. Uh, looking at the weight matrices of decoding models, there are a lot of things going on. They are not as interpretable, but yeah. perhaps that's not the case with encoding models, and that's where we can go and look for mechanisms. Yeah. Fair to say. Yeah. That, that's that's basically what we're what we're trying to to say here. Yeah. Yeah. The the these weight matrices are, are much more interpretable because because you can you can see to to what variable it, it like each weight is actually mapped to and and it, these are like tangible things right so so how we're going to how we're going to be like looking at these things um, later on is that we're going to be able to see the, the weights of uh, different task variables such as the animal's choice um, the 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 history so like the the choice that it made on the previous trial what stimulus how, how much did it weigh the stimulus that that was presented to it um, how much did, in, in, in the case of uh, the, the, the paper that I'm going to discuss briefly now, it's um, different types of movements. What, what, what weights do these movements have, right? So it, it's, it's very, very, very interpretable. That's basically the, 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 what, we're, what we're leveraging here for this kind of question.
All right. And so in terms of, uh, so now I'm going to discuss about current applications for linear encoding models. And for this, I'm going to briefly go over the beginning uh, uh, of this paper. Um, it was published by our lab in 2019, um, titled Single Trial Neural Dynamics are Dominated by Richly Varied Movements. Okay. And so uh, here's the, the question and task structure. So basically what we were interested in, if we look at A, is that we have you, we, we can have different kinds of movements that the animals can make during, during a task. So you can have movements that are instructed, as in if, I'm, if, if, I, if I require a mouse to report its choice by licking uh, a spout to receive water reward, we, can, we call that lick an instructed movement because we, we asked it to perform this movement. But we can also have uninstructed movements, as, which are uh, basically the opposite of this. So a any, animal, any movements that the, anim that the animals make that aren't, aren't necessarily required by the task, right? And then these movements can actually be, be divided into two. So we can have task-independent instructed movements. So yes, we know that a lick is, is, is instructed by the task, but it can occur at the same point in, at, at any given trial. In, in the case of the example that I was presenting, if the animal always looks for reward when, it's, when, it has to report to, when it has to report its choice, that lick event is a task-aligned lick event. But if it's licking at a random moment in the task, we will call that a task-independent lick or a task-independent instructed movement. So the top left corner of that uh, matrix here. Um, and the same thing for uninstructed movements. Um, this, it, it's very intuitive to think of uh, a task-independent uninstructed movement. So you can think of this as just like a fidget or, or something that doesn't really relate to the task that you're doing at hand. But if, for example, um, and, and Anne always does this example of, if you need to keep track of time, and in order to keep track of time, you, you, for example, you need to wait for one second, and if like doing this always allows you to like time that one second, we call that we call that uninstructed movement task aligned because it's it, it it's stereotyped in respect to what 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 we're asking the animal to do, but it's not necessarily a movement that we require it to do. It's m more something that the animal came up with by itself. Okay. Uh, another example, the one I like is like like a pro tennis or pro golfer. Um, like in the, in the case of tennis, like there's a reason that they will bounce the ball like four times, five times, like same thing every time. That's, def that's definitely something that could happen, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's 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 tough to it's tough to to discern there, right? Right. Where whether like it, what what the intent is, right? Because we can't ask it. Like, are you doing this because you think it's actually related, or just like helps you in doing what you know it, you actually have to do? Um, yeah. It's it's an interesting question that we're definitely thinking about in the lab, to say the least. No. No? OK. All right. And so um, I'm actually going to jump to C to explain how, how, how the task works. Um, so basically, how the task works is that they, they, initiate a, they, they can initiate a trial by holding on to these handles that you see here. And so if they hold, if they hold the handles, I, I forget if it's like um, Half a second. Do you know the, the duration of the handle grab, Matt? Uh, yeah, I think they have to grab them for half a second. For half a second, right? Yeah. So they 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 hold it for ha for half a second, and then um, the stimulus is delivered. In in the case of this task, the stimulus was delivered twice with a variable interval delay between the two stimuli, and then um, there's this delay period after the stimulus ends, and then they have to um, report, and then. There's a, the, the response experience begins, and that's where, where they can report their choice. And if they made a correct choice, then they, see, they, they receive water. But if the, the choice was incorrect, then they don't receive any water. And this is just a, a bottom view um, 
of how, how the mouse looks perf while performing this task. Um, it's a head fits mouse um, because we're, we're recording a neural activity from it from a wild field imaging setup that I'm going to explain in the, in the, next, in the next figure. But it, it requires the animal to be, to be fit so we can hold the microscope over its, the, the macroscope over its head. And here are the two uh, spouts that um, they deliver water um, depending on whether the animal made a correct or, or incorrect choice. And then uh, this panel in D, it's, it's just showing that uh, um, mice can actually learn how to, how to do this task. Um, if we, we, we do this task in um, perform, uh, delivering both audio and uh, visual stimuli. It's a rate discrimination task. So if, it's, if we present a, a low rate stimulus, so you can think of that as in, in the terms of the visual task, it would be just light flashes. And it could be either like lights flashing at a very low rate or a very high rate. Um, and in terms of the auditory, uh, the auditory trials, it's uh, auditory clicks. So it was just if the clicks are very close together, it's a high rate stimulus, and if not, then it's a low rate stimulus. And they basically, uh, uh, an animal that's an expert in the in the audio task performs over 80% uh, correct in, in in the trials, but performs that chance in visual trials because it wasn't trained on, on visual trials. And the same thing, uh, the opposite can be said about um, animals that were trained in the visual portion of this trial. Okay, so everybody, everybody understand uh, the task? Okay, all right, okay. And so, um, as I mentioned, we're recording neural activity um, from these animals uh, while they're performing this task. And we use this uh, method called wide field imaging for recording cortex wide neural dynamics. So what's really cool about this is that uh, through a surgery, you can just, um, I believe it's just a glue that you apply and basically you can clear the, the skull and make it transparent enough so that you can just hold a camera over the head of the mouse and you can record um, neural activity from there, okay? And, oh, and I, I don't know if this is uh, obvious or not, but uh, the way that we record neural activity is uh, using uh, fluorescent reporters um, for neural activity. So um, they're, um, in this case, this animal is expressing um, this protein called gcamp 6 s in all uh, its cytatory neurons. And what this protein does is that whenever uh, an action potential uh, uh, is the, an actual potential happens that triggers a, a calcium influx into the cell um, in order to allow for vesicle release. And that calcium influx, we're using that as a proxy for neural activity. So the more a neuron fires, the more calcium comes in and the more um, calcium binds to GCAMP and then more fluorescence um, shines, okay? All right, and so uh, here in F, we're showing you how, how the, the average uh, uh, cortex-wide activity looks like during the different time periods of the task. So during the, the hold period, so when they're holding the, the two handles, we have a lot of activity um, around this area, uh, which is most, I, I believe that's mostly like motor cortex. And then here in the, in the stimulus periods, this is for a visual trial, we see that for both the stimuli, we see that the, the bulk of the activity is around the visual cortex uh, of the animal. And then um, during the delay period, it's a little bit more widespread. Um, you need to do, do more. Th this isn't the right visualization to observe delay-related uh, cortex activity because it's a little bit more subtle. But basically, and then in the response period, which is when the animal is receiving the reward, you see uh, the, the great majority of the cortex just lighting up um, to reward delivery, which um, we know that it's, it, it's a very salient event for, for the animal, so this is sort of expected. And then uh, here in G, uh, and the black choices correspond to visual trials and the red choices correspond to um, auditory trials. And what we're plotting in the, um, what we're plotting here on that axis is just time in the trial. Um, these gray bars are when the two, uh, when the stimuli are presented and the Y axis is just the, the change in fluorescence um, in comparison to baseline. And here we're looking at uh, three different areas, B1, HL, and M2. And, and we can basically see, for example, for B1, that in, in vision trials, we see a, a, an increase in activity when the stimuli are presented, which makes sense because these are visual stimuli and visual cortex responds to visual stimuli, by definition. Um, and then in HL, we don't really see much of a difference there. 
um, and and in M2, um, not too much, but a lot in the in the in the response for uh, the same as in as in HL. Um, yeah. Okay. Then I'm just I'm just gonna skip over this. And so the the, the question that so, so we have this method that we can record neural activity and we have all these task events, but how do we put this together? How do we determine the impact of different kinds of movements on neural activity? And the answer to that is, is using a linear encoding model. Yeah, of course. I, it's, it's definitely, a, uh, you can go too deep, so like you can go past cortex for sure. Um, I think it's about like 200 microns deep. Is that, you've analyzed this data before? Yeah. But nothing subcortical. No, I, I don't believe anything subcortical. Yeah. Yeah. We would need probably stronger lasers for that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Actually. No, so you're, you're, you, you have pixels, basically. Um, you, you know, for, for this, I'm um, not, gonna, not gonna get into it because it's a bit more complicated, but what, what we do is that we can, um, using singular value decomposition, we can decompose the imaging data into different um, like components that we can then use for our analysis and for reconstructing these maps later on as well. Yeah. No, that's a great point. I'd like. Yeah, it'd, it'd be it'd be so harder. <laughs> yeah. Like we can't see that at all with wide field, so that's definitely a yeah a trade off. Yeah, this mainly just looking at bulk activity, but but the advantage of do, doing this versus like other measurements of like bulk activity, like fiber photometry, fiber photometry for example, is that it's just like how many regions you're sampling at the same time, right? So. The, the, the great thing about this is that you're literally recording over the entire cortex at the same time. So you, you can, yeah, it, it's, just, it's just very useful for that, for that case. Yeah. But because of that concern, the authors of this paper did two photon imaging oh, yeah. as well. And, and EFIS imaging, to yeah. Kind of confirm what they're finding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right, so linear encoding model. I left this arrow there. So, <laughs> so basically, okay. Um, so we have we have all these different variables, right? So we have we have just like the, the time in the trial. Uh, we have whether the animal um, what what was the, the choice that the animal reported? Whether well, it was like a, a left lick or like a right lick? What was the previous choice that it did? So what what was the choice that it made on the previous trial? And then the the success or the previous success, whether it got it right or it got it wrong. Okay. Oh, and I didn't mention it here, but you can also have uh, stimulus strength, right? So what was, was, it a, was it a very obviously left uh, choice trial? Was it a very obviously right choice trial? Or was, it like a, or was the stimulus a bit like ambiguous? So we call that being closer to the category boundary, um, where the animal sort of doesn't have enough evidence to make a very, very confident decision. But we can also have other, other kinds of, of variables, right? We can have um, pupil, pupil size. So how, how, is, how is the pupil size um, changing throughout the trial? We can have whisking events. So how do the different whiskers move, um, as well as legs or like hind limb movements? And so we can basically, if we, the, it's, this, this division doesn't really, it isn't really consequential or anything, it's just for um, explanation purposes. So we basically have, we can put task variables and movement variables together into this thing that we call a design matrix. And this design matrix is basically what we're going to be, is the information that we're giving the model that we build, and it's the information that the model, 
can use in order to try to predict what the neural activity will look like. So what we do is that we take this design matrix, we input it into a rich regression model, and then from that, the output is that we can get predicted neural activity as well as beta weights for each of the, the, the variables of regressors um, that we input into the design matrix. And so in terms of the actual math that goes behind this, we're going to be covering that in the, in the later presentations and um, in, in the notebooks. Okay. And quick question. Yeah. <laughs> so your task variables here are, uh, are they binary? Some of them are. Yeah. And your movement are continuous? Yes. Okay. And so here you say rich regression model, but uh, and you reference uh, for your addition, you can use rich regression yeah. or lasso. Yeah. But these are on top of some other models, usually, right? So you're, you might be doing a linear regression or yeah. whatever type of regression. Yeah. Or what is that model here? Are you doing linear regression with yeah. regression with regularization? Exactly. It's, a, it's just a linear regression model, and then we just add a, the, the regularization term for rich, which is just that um, I believe we, we square um, the weights afterwards. And that, um, I believe, helps induce sparseness in the, in the weight matrix, right? Uh, or is that lasso? Lasso is more Las sparse. Lasso is more sparse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the tricky thing is like, yeah, like coding, coding these variables, because they're all, like, you have these continuous variables and mm. these binary ones. We're going to go over how, how to sort of handle those and put them all yeah. in one design matrix later on today. Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, does the task variables also include sensors in all of them? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 do, I, just, I just put some, some there in the slide, but it's not that this is, this is the list. This is just a, an example. There, there are a bunch of, a bunch of different things there. Um, but, the, but you can generally think of them as like task-related variables or um, movement variables, right? Although it's kind of weird to think of pupil as, as, as pupil dilations are like movements, but technically the, the movement of the pupil. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? All right. Okay. All right. And so, how 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 to so okay, how 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 do we start thinking about so we 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 ran the model, we got some output from the model, right? Um, how what do we do with that? And so, for here, the questions that the the, the where we're trying to address is which variables are most important for for the model success. In in other words which variables are, are driving neural activity the, the most, or which variables are, are most, um, um, have, have higher weights um, in, in this encoding process. And the way that we can get around that is that we can uh, use these, we can compare these two measurements. So we have this uh, CVR squared uh, measurement and this delta R squared measurement. And the CVR squared measurement, what we're doing is that we're, we're creating these single variable models. So I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned that we, ha that we can put this, this very big design matrix with a bunch of different variables um, into the rich regression. We call that the full model. But we can also fit these models with just one variable. And so what, what, we, can, what we can say from that is how much, how much variance can this one variable explain in the neural data? And that's what we call the, the CVR squared because it's cross-validated, um, I believe, tenfold for this paper. But another, another question that we can do is, is how much, so we, we know how much this variable by itself can, 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 can predict neural activity, but we, that doesn't tell us how much unique variance this, this, this variable is contributing to the, to the full model. So we, what we can do is that we can take the full model and then we can um, shuffle, basically shuffle this, this one variable that we're interested in. Um, and by shuffling, we're just sort of like um, removing the information that was present there. And then we can subtract the, the CVR script from, like the, from the full model and the, this, um, this shuffled, uh, this single variable shuffled model. And when we subtract that, we can, we can, we can determine what was the variance that was lost when we, when we shuffled this variable. And we call that the, the delta R squared, which is showing us, which is showing us this, uh, this unique contribution of this variable to, the, to predicting um, the neural activity in the model. Why shuffle and not remove? So I, be so <clears throat> I believe that the, 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 pur the purpose of like shuffling it is that um, 
you, you don't want to necessarily change the, the, the rank of the matrix, right, um, in order to make it more comparable. I, I, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure what you mean, what, what, what you mean by that. Um, do you? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you're the one who, who's run this model. <laughs> so, um, if we want to sort of knock out uh, a few regressors from the model, we will shuffle them in time. So, like, we can have time. shuffle in time, yeah. So we sort of break up any sort of relationship between these regressors, and then the, the time in our series of neural activity that we're trying to create. Mike, uh, I'm follow up question. Sampling. Um, do you just go random sampling, or do you shuffle trying to maintain some elements of the data, some structure of the data, or is it the random sampling? Because so we we've always just randomly shuffled it, yeah. um, and the those regret like the variance that those explain no. goes to zero or very close to it. No. Um, the one thing is we shuffle each column, each regressor individually. We don't like we don't just and move them all together, because then we, we would be preserving some sort of like correlation. Yeah. yeah. The idea is that we want to break the whatever structure is there in the in the time series for this variable. We want to break that. Yeah. Just to add to that, but there are techniques where you can do like Fourier decomposition and then shuffle frequencies with it, and you keep some of the inherent structure like in particular bands. Um, you, you had a question? So, like, if you have, like, one variable bound to be the most important, and then you... Like, Sorry, I, I missed, I missed uh, that so part. So, here, for example, if you bound on one single element variable as the most important one, and then you adjust the, like, uh, weight for the original one, and then... If, if you... Uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm not listening to... So I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I think that um, we're, we're, we don't really go to that to that step of then adjusting the variable in, in the full model back because what we're trying to see here is is actually the, the, the finding is which which of these variables have like um, have the highest um, explain the the highest amount of variance in the data, right? So if um, I don't think we've had any reason to like go back and, and, and kind of like retroactively adjust weights in the in the yeah. full model. We don't have, they're just sort of two different windows into what what yeah. a variable is doing. Like the, the weights will tell you more like choice is modulating this neuron in this way throughout the trial. Yeah. Um, where these like the single variable model is more just kind of like a like a an aggregate measure, just like how much variance can you explain. Yeah. With this particular um, variable, but yeah, we don't we don't like mix models or anything like that. Yeah. Um, usually, if we look at beta weights, we kind of look in the full model because mm -hmm. we want we want that beta weight in context of everything else that's happening. Yeah. Um, that a lot of times that's referred to as like a kernel um, yeah. or the regressor. But then, if we just want to see like, well, how good do these models do with only stimulus? Then we but the beta weights would be less interpretable um, in that case, I would say, because they're probably capturing 
R squared that you see on the bottom? Yeah. It's, tell me if this is the same thing that you're doing or not, but what we do is we train like the full full model. Yeah. And then we will knock it or we'll, we'll shuffle like the the stimulus regressor. If you do you retrain the model? When after shuffling? We the shuffle and then we retrain. Yeah. So why retrain? Um we, we won't see how much variance was lost when when we when we remove the structure that was um, of this variable. The the idea is is that if if we see how much variance was lost, then that 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 variance then probably corresponds to um, the unique contribution that this variable had to the full model. Yeah. Um, for the variance condition, I think that we have that just now. It's another way that we also retrain the model. I was thinking it's like We'll go. We'll go into into the into the 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 map more more deeply, and um, especially in the notebooks. Okay, and um, so it's time's coming up. Um, but yeah, and so if if we if we can we can then visualize um, what's the CVR squared as well as the delta R squared values for all the different um, regressors that we input into the design matrix. So here you can it's it's more than just the the ones that I mentioned um, in that slide. And if we just look at the at the single variable models, as as in like the the CVR squared, we can see that, for example, um, the the stimulus uh, regressor, such as like uh, a, a left auditory uh, stimulus or a right auditory stimulus, um, they're not um, impact. They're 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 not being able to explain much variance in um, using a single variable models. Um, but then you see that variables such as choice. Um, what the outcome or the success of the trial, or just where in the trial you are, um, are able to explain quite a, quite a bit of variance. Um, and this is this 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 makes sense because it really is like a, a time locked uh, um, experiment. So things happen at different uh, uh, time points. Um, you also see that instructed movements, um, which are uh, again the, the movements that we require from 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 the animal. Um, they also explain quite a bit of uh, variance in the single variable models, but then it really is these uninstructed movements, such as um, uh, the the movements of different body parts, and even just like the general the the general uh, movement amount or motion energy, how we call it, um, or me, that really explains the the most amount of variance um, across all the regressors. And that really is um, accentuated even more when we look at the delta R squared, where, for example, um, in these task-related uh, regressors, time was the one that had the most, uh, the highest value, the highest CVR squared value. But then when we actually remove that and, and, and fit the model once, once again, um, there's uh, no, there's the delta R squared is near zero. So even though it did explain quite a bit of variance when the model was just trained with this model, it can, if this variable isn't there, the model can still, still perform the, the, virtually the same. But the same thing can't be said about these, these movement-related variables, and we see this um, kind of modestly with these instructed movements, but even more drastically with these uninstructed movements, and especially the um, variables such as like whisking or the, the motion energy or just like the, the general magnitude uh, uh, of movements that occurred during the trial. Okay. Yes, yeah. There was a paper a while ago by Ken Harris mm -hmm. titled uh, Mysterious Correlations in Systems of Neuroscience. Right. Are you going to. This is the autocorrelations one? Part? Is it's the nature of them? Okay. It, I, I just remember one about auto. The bioarchive. Bioarchive paper? Bioarchive paper? Are you okay. going to comment on that uh, yeah. in relation to what you're talking about? Um, I wasn't planning on to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I know that we're. So just to understand, this is the issue of, because I, I, I don't know if I'm thinking about the same paper, but this the, the issue of like nonsense correlations in, in the data. Yeah, th this, this is something that, that we've thought about. And um, for example, like um, Matt and I put out like a, a preprint recently with another um, um, grad student in the lab. And 
um, we 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 actually made sure that we weren't that the 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 fines that we were seeing weren't related to these like autocorrelation values. I'm not entirely sure for for this paper whether any any attempts were made in in. But can you just explain in a sort of intuitive way? Oh, okay. Where these nonsense correlations come from and how you can sort yeah. of control for them or filter them out of a correlation analysis. Right. Right. Um, so I I believe. I believe that, and I haven't thought about this in, in the context of this task, um, but I believe that in terms of nonsense correlations, you could, you could see them in the case of uh, collinearity uh, between regressors. So you have a, if you have different, so uh, the, the example that Matt was uh, making at the beginning where you have that um, the, if, if the animal performed 90% uh, 90 90 correct throughout the entire trial, right? Um, you're going to, you're obviously the, the choice that the animal makes and the outcome of said choice are going to be correlated with each other, right? Um, so that's, it's, it's definitely something to, to, that, that you have to keep in mind and ways of going around it is that you can um, kind of subsample from, from, from different trials and make sure to like counterbalance. So in the case of, of, of this example, if you have, um, if, if, you're, if you have, let's say, 500 total trials, you want to make sure that it, uh, ideally you would want to have 250 trials where the animal made a correct choice and 250 trials where the animal didn't make a correct choice, right? So that way you're not, you're not biasing um, the result because of this inherent collinearity that occurs in the data, right? Training is hard. <laughs> yeah. Tr Yeah, you know, ways that we get around is that sometimes we have to um, take trials from various sessions. You know, not not may, maybe maybe we can't always l just look at one session at a time. We have to concatenate between different sessions in order to in order to 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 be able to to make these uh, counterbalancing uh, samplings. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> Yeah, of course. The, the weights that are getting on here. Are, I'm surprised to see that right and left vision yeah. is so small. Yeah. Here in a single, I guess I'm not terribly surprised that once you remove that, that, that variance when you get distributed to other variables, which are going to be a lot of correlation in terms of what choice you make. Mm -hmm. But it, um, I guess the question is like, how, how do I interpret that? That when you show the yeah. plot, Yeah. In the yeah. Like here in the ridge, it's it's not loading highly onto those correlations. Yeah. Why? What, what does that yeah. Mean? So um, read the paper. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do my homework. Yeah. Um, no, no. That that's that's actually something that 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 was very perplexing um, to the lab um, at that time. Um, I say to the lab because I wasn't in the lab when when when, no. when this paper was done. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's definitely confusing. And, and what it's in terms of how to interpret that—that's kind of what we're what we're trying to to do now um, in the lab, right? We so so you know why why may, maybe if we if we did this with just this this is just a a, a guess of mine. If we if instead of being able to predict neural activity across the entire cortex. We're, we're focusing on um, if, if we were if we had like two uh, two P data from uh, visual cortex, for example, then maybe we would then maybe uh, visual stimulus would have a would, would have a, a higher um, CVR squared and pro probably also delta R squared um, in that case. Um, but yeah, we, we yeah that that could be one way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Kind of well, you do like, you know, I mean, but it works, right? It shows that the visual cortex is sort of your ROI for the visual stimuli. So yeah. The initial maps. I but mean, if you, I, I guess it, back there is something happening. Yeah, I can, I can look back at the. Um, I mean, the Sorry. other. Like, that's very clear. I, yeah. And that's from look at the scale, though. Model. 
I, I, oh, that's if a, that's I, the R I squared, see. the delta R squared. Okay. So it's yeah. small for sure, but it does kind of point you to the But spot. it's robust. It, it's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, exactly. And the reason it's small, you could have a, a bad model. Like the visual stimulus is it's like related to the neural activity of some polynomial yeah. term. Like, yeah. It's, okay. we just wanted to keep them all, or the authors of this paper wanted everything comparable, just like a basic yeah. linear model. Exactly. Right. Glean something different from this than I do from the bar plot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one. I believe I believe that, for example, for the for the video um, video ME, it's um, we we do we perform single value decomposition on the video, and we take the uh, the first two hundred um, components because they explain um, up to ninety nine percent of the variance. So we think that's pretty representative of of that that regressor. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. No. Of this particular plot. Mm -hmm. There is another one in the paper where yeah. they split the variables into like three different groups. Mm -hmm. Like, um, on th it's the groups that you see here. Yeah. Um, and they compare the variances explained. And it's still the case that the uninstructed movements explain a lot more variance than the task. But and when you when you lump all of the task variables together, it's actually more regressors, quite a, quite a bit more regressors than just the uninstructed. But yeah, I think that's in the paper. That plot, it's in the paper. Yeah, 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 I can. But that is a good point. Like, if you have many more regressors for a variable, like, yeah, it might, it might be better. Single neuron, single trial. Yeah, so. I believe, uh, not this one. Yeah, so I believe this one is the one that you were talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, okay, and oh, sorry. Did anyone have any other question? Sorry, sorry just uh, this is more clarification. But the CDR square, the bright green plots are variance explained in the neural data by this single variable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and you have this for single variables because you run the model with one variable at a time. Yeah. I see. It, it wouldn't be um, a bit more intuitive. How do you run this with all variables to see what the uh, CDR square would look like? Yeah, I believe that's 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 what we call the the, the full model. And oh, yeah, yeah, it's it's not it's not present in in, in this plot. Um, but ba but basically, we we're we're using that information for the to calculate the delta R squared. So for for calculating the delta R squared, we're 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 taking the full model. And then we're subtracting, um, or the other way around, we're, and, and we're subtracting the, the full model with the shuffled regressor. And so basically, we're, we're removing the information of one regressor, and then we subtract that value from the full model value. And that's how we get the delta R squared. Mm -hmm. Once more, can you iterate? Intuitively, I would still train a model with all my variables and then look at the weight. Mm -hmm. But here, you follow the approach that you present. Yeah. We, it's not intuitive to me, no. but uh, we, it, it's not that we, ha we, we don't, it's not that we don't do the, f the, the full model um, analysis. It's just that the, 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 the purpose for, for this one is that we want we wanted to look at 
the the impact of of single variables um, in the um, for 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 um, in in order to predict the, the neural activity. So like the question of this wasn't necessarily like oh how how well can the how well can the model perform with all of this data that we're putting into it? It's more so like what contribution do do these single bear, do these individual variables have towards the 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 full model's performance? Sure. Yeah. Maybe one more thing I'll add is like mm -hmm. a lot of the like especially the task regressors, there's like you know some of them have like 75 data weights because of how they're coded into the design matrix. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to, I mean, you can either like sort of lump, like, like you need a summary sort of statistic or value for each regressor. So I guess you could like lump these data weights together or average them or something. Or you could just get the, the variance explained by all of those data weights. So I think they're both ways you can go. Yeah. Um, and any, any other questions? OK. Um, I think that's, that's it for time. Um, that's it for the introduction. Um, and basically, um, later on, what we're going to go is uh, more into the math of like the basic stuff regression, as well as uh, fitting cr and cross-validation, as well as looking, um, coding the, what to do with the actual model outputs and how to visualize them. Um, you had a, you raised your Yeah. Um, does including being able to include all of these additional variables, the uninstructed, all the stuff that we typically don't include yeah. in our task side, help with the interpretability of the kind of task related variables, the things that you are in fact, like cleaning up variants, making things mm -hmm. more complicated? So the. Mm -hmm. Or does it steal? <laughs> steal yeah, the, this, the sort of the story that I've True question. Is, like, why even use this encoding model was. The postdoc that collected this data was just noticing, like he was looking at the raw wide field signals, like yeah. averages, um, and you know he could recompute like the trial averages, but the, the variance across trials was actually very big, yeah. and they had no idea where it was coming from because it wasn't like the stimulus reward whatever activity, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they they sort of had a hypothesis that it was like movement related, and that's why they built this. So I mean, you could fit some really good model just to the movements and like yeah. regress that out of your your activity and then do your analysis. Um, but no. yeah, I think there's many. But what our lab would argue <laughs> is that the, the, the this variability in between trials is 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 do, is because the the brain encodes movements very strongly, and so if the movements are different across trials, then that's why you're going to observe a lot of heterogeneity in um, in your data. Just as a biology response to your question, <laughs> okay, um, and yeah, um, that's it. If we don't have any uh, any other questions, no. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>